<laughs> and we are live. Hello and welcome to the panel on inflection points as part of the Horasis Extraordinary Meeting. I see that we've got a handful of people on. We have all of our panelists on. Uh, I see people have joined. Hello, Robert. I see uh, Mr. Robert Rubenstein. Um, Michael. I see a Michael Ross. That's a, that's a familiar face right there. Uh, Demetra. Demetra is also a familiar face. We'll, get, we'll give it one minute um, for other people to join. Uh, I'll ask our panelists, <clears throat> if you're not speaking, then I'll ask you to, I'll ask you to go on mute. Uh, unlike in Zoom, I do not have the power to mute you. So that How is. How do I uh, mute? Um, hang on. Just mute. That is a big, uh, big trust I'm I'm putting in our panelists today. Thanks. My, uh, my, my. Those who are joining us, um, welcome. We have an exciting panel lined up for you today. Give another uh, one minute, thirty seconds or so. Really quick, while we're waiting for people, I'm kind of curious, Nikhil. Nikhil, if you could go, I know you've uh, listened in on a few of the other uh, panels and the sessions. Was there anything in particular that's uh, stood out to you so far? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you know, I, I think we look at. I, I think the main thing that's come out really is that COVID could actually be an opportunity for us to really reshape. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of things. And uh, so I think that, you know, we've learned a lot. Um, some people have said it's a fire drill I heard earlier. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, we, we come out of, of, there will be a lot of opportunities that come out of this. And as entrepreneurs, as members of EO, we always um, crave opportunities and that's what we do. And so uh, I think um, I'm looking okay. forward to, to, the, to this. Okay. On, on that note, I think that's actually a great note to uh, start us off on this panel, and we'll get started. So welcome, everyone, to our panel on Inflection Points. I'm your moderator today. My name is Ryan Villanueva. I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm a member of the Entrepreneurs Organization, a peer-to-peer -peer network with over 14,000 members in over 100 countries globally. Uh, we're all business owners, uh, owning at least one business with at least $1 million, uh, annual revenue, $1 million US dollars annual revenue. Um, so all of us are business owners. And uh, in this panel, I believe we'll be able to offer a perspective of entrepreneurs and business owners globally um, on how we've navigated, managed, and led our businesses and our companies since the beginning of 2020 throughout the COVID crisis. Um, and I'm accompanied here by my fellow members, um, who I'll introduce one at a time. So I have here uh, Nikhil Hirda Romani, I'm dialing in from London. Is that right, Nikhil? I think you're dialing in from That's London. That's correct. Yes, I'm in London. Uh, you're the director of the Hirda Romani Group, family-owned diversified conglomerate with core business uh, in the manufacture of apparel through its factories in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and Ethiopia. And Nikhil, I know that very important to you is sustainability, that that has been integrated into your business. You've been involved in this uh, for a long time, especially in sustainable fashion. And within the entrepreneurs organization, you've actually led the uh, adoption of our sustainability strategy within EO. And you also serve as the co-chair for um, external relations within EO. So uh, glad to have you on this panel. Um, Thank you. Great to be here. I know we're also accompanied by uh, Marsha Rawls, who's the president and CEO of Close Monday Productions uh, in the United States. Marsha, I think you're dialing in from Florida. Is that right? Yes. I've been sheltering in place in Florida for, since the beginning of the year. Uh, at least it's sunny down there. At least I yeah. hope it is sunny and warm. Um, your company is dedicated to advocacy for the arts. Um, and advising entrepreneurs globally. Uh, I know you also share a passion for health and wellness, that you also have a health and wellness business in addition, and that you are a champion for social impact within the entrepreneurs organization. Just, uh, was it just last week that you organized an EO Impact Day with over, what was the total number of uh, attendees for that, for that event last week? Well, we had almost 600 register and about 258 that attended. So we had cool. yeah, a lot of fun, great speakers. 
It's uh, it's a growing movement within EO and amongst entrepreneurs, I think, globally. Social impact and social enterprise and sustainability. Uh, we're also accompanied by Eiling Wong, who's calling in from Malaysia. Uh, Eiling is the owner and director of the Decora Tour. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> Uh, a a business that has built a strong reputation for creating innovative design experiences for homes, retail and commercial spaces, and delivering exceptional turnkey interior solutions. And Eileen, I believe you're the past president of the EO chapter in Malaysia, correct? Very much so. Great. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, We also have Alan Young uh, dialing in from Nashville in the United States. Alan is the CEO of Armor Concepts a Nashville-based manufacturer that distributes security and repair products throughout the U.S. and Canada. And Alan, you're the past president of EO Nashville, which has been the star chapter, I think, like the chapter that, at least on the East Coast, uh, we all look up to uh, in EO. Isn't that, isn't that right? I would love to, uh, love to believe that it is. We're the, we're the largest chapter in the, uh, in the United States. And, uh, you know, EO is just an amazing organization, just period. So it's really hard to say which is the best chapter. But uh, I, I love living in Nashville. That's, that's awesome. I actually visited Nashville uh, just recently. It is all, both an awesome town and good to know it is a great uh, EO chapter. Awesome. Um, we are also joined by Amer uh, Nasaruddin, uh, dialing in from Jordan. Uh, who is the co-founder and managing partner at Primus, a global company and market leader with a specialized focus on software solutions, consultancy, and IT infrastructure uh, based in Amman. Um, and uh, Amir, I believe you're also the co-chair for external relations. Correct. Uh, and and if I'm, was one of the people who started. E- you started the chapter in Jordan. That is correct. That's very cool. I did not realize that. And I, if there's one more thing I can add. You, um, we've also built some of our external relationships with some big uh, institutions. Yes, I am the ambassador to IFC re, uh, World Bank Relations as well. Very cool. Very cool. So EO has these external relationships with different organizations around the world, uh, international organizations, including the IFC, the World Bank, and the United Nations. Um, and finally, we uh, are joined by Christina uh, Calvo. Uh, dialing in from Costa Rica. Christina is the CEO of Overview Perspective, a business group in the industries of travel, technology, digital transformation, sustainability, and education with remote teams in U.S., India, South and Central America, and Spain. And within EO, I believe you serve on the Global Strategic Alliances Committee. Is that right, Christina? Yes. Thank you. Very cool. And you're the past president of EO Costa Rica. Is that right? Or you, no. you're, uh, you serve within EO Costa Rica? I serve, yeah, right now I'm in the Accelerator Program. Can you, t- can you share with uh, our, our audience, what's the Accelerator Program? The Accelerator Program, it's actually um, a program that helps businesses uh, after two, that have revenue after $250,000. Um, and it's a program based on scaling up and uh, to help all these businesses uh, get to that million dollar mark. And so it's a program that I, I'm very passionate about because it's bringing in a lot of um, businesswomen into the organization globally and also mid, uh, mid-sized um, businesses to grow and scale. So very, very cool. proud to lead that here in Costa Rica. Very cool. I'm, I'm, in a, I'm a graduate of Accelerator myself personally. So oh, I started my own journey exactly. as an entrepreneur because of uh, EO and the Accelerator program, specifically here in Boston, where I am. Uh, I was the past president in Boston. That's amazing. And, yeah. So thank you all. Uh, we have a great panel lined up, and I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation about inflection points and, again, leading, managing and navigating our businesses and our companies um, throughout the pandemic and since the beginning of the year. <clears throat> so if you're just joining us, um, we are all members of the Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, a peer-to-peer network with over 14,000 members globally in over 100 countries. And we're going to share our experiences um, leading our companies through the pandemic. And um, what I believe you'll get out of this, if you're listening in, is... I think a lot of the sessions here in Horasis and it, as part of the United Nations General Assembly Week focus on um, politics and diplomacy 
and uh, the efforts of our government leaders to support citizens um, and business owners. And what I believe we'll provide is that business owner perspective. What does it look like? What has it look, looked like over the last year to lead our companies, to make some of those hard decisions within our companies, to uh, work with our political leaders, our government leaders, to help uh, our communities and our customers, our workers, our employees. Um, and what does it look like going forward for our businesses? What does it look like? What does the future look like for entrepreneurs globally? So that's what I believe you'll get out of today's panel. And the first question I wanted to start off with uh, for everybody was just, you know, coming into this year, coming into 2020, I don't know if anyone could have predicted, expected what was going to happen. And I know that as business owners, like we're planning our businesses year to year. My first question for everybody was coming into 2020, what were your expectations? What were the goals for your business? What were you planning to do? And if I can just walk down the line on, on this first question, uh, Nikhil, do you want to, you want to start us off? Sure, sure. So um, as Ryan mentioned, my, my core business, um, it's a family business, is, is, is a manufacturer of, of apparel um, in, in the subcontinent. Um, I don't think anyone would have imagined what we would be facing, what we have faced in the last couple of months, not even in our lifetime. Um, you know, there have been key themes. Uh, I think we have lived in a world of, of fast fashion over the last years. I think over the last 20 or 30 years, you know, the price of clothing um, has actually um, gone down while the cost of making it has gone up. So it's one of the few deflationary industries, I would say. Um, and, and therefore, you know, uh, people are buying more frequently. Um, uh, and, and, you know, so we see a sort of a change in, in that sort of in buying habits and behavior. Uh, as Ryan also mentioned, I, my role in the business has been sustainability. Uh, and uh, so fast fashion really is not really regarded as, as being very sustainable. If you look at the themes of what we were trying to do at the beginning of the year, um, sustainability was a key theme. Um, you know, the apparel manufacturing process is, is one of the most polluting industries in the world. Um, it takes uh, a pair of jeans, for example, it it's, uh, takes 10,000 litres of water. Um, so we've always been focusing on doing the right thing. We're a fourth generation family business. Uh, we always believe in you know, sustainability has been very much part of our ethos um, for many, many years. So for the beginning of the year, we were focusing on on how we could be more sustainable, looking at, at, at our own sort of both on the environmental side and on the people side, and also looking at how we could cut waste through innovation. Um, so again, we never really thought we'd be facing what we did. Um, if, if there's one silver lining that comes out of COVID, is that there's a lot more awareness of sustainability going forward now. And I think sustainability is going to be very much top of the agenda in all businesses going forward. Interesting. I don't think anyone wants to go through what we've gone through again. I think that's, that's very interesting because you've been involved in sustainability for a long time. And I think that's going to be a running theme, I think, throughout this panel and especially for what's going forward. Uh, I want to direct the same question to Christina. Um, coming into this year, coming into 2020, what were the goals for your business? What were you thinking 2020 was going to be for your business? Um, that's a great question. Um, actually, for us, uh, one of the since we're in the technology industry and the travel industry, we were doing a shift, uh, combining a lot of those things into virtual reality, automation, doing a lot of things, right? And we were getting ready to launch, for example, a lot of new things within uh, mid-year of 2020. Um, and then COVID hit and the travel industry is one of the, the worst hit industries. So at first for us, like all of the goals that I had, were completely just broken, right? It, I couldn't focus on that at all, right? So I needed to shift uh, the business and shift um, the strategy. As Nikhil was, was saying, for us, especially um, bringing what our travel business basically is held in, in Costa Rica and we are sustainable. We're leaders in sustainability along the travel industry, right? So we use that uh, we have been doing that for the past 10 years, putting sustainability at the core, and that has helped us um, pivot our conversation with, with, a, with a new perspective in the business. So, yeah. That is uh, that's really interesting. I know that a lot of us probably had a lot of travel planned <laughs> going into this exactly. year. Exactly. <clears throat> Especially those of us within EO as well as our own businesses. Um, 
And it things soon became very clear going into 2020 that that was just not going to play out. And so I'm going to want to ask that in a second. I'm still in the 2020 mode. I, I want to ask Marsha uh, next. Going again, coming into 2020, um, you know, again, what were the goals for your business, but also in the context of the United States? Like, I think coming into 2020, we were expecting this to be an interesting year already, and then you know everything that's happened since. But Marsha, what was what was the beginning of 2020 like for you? So thank you, Ryan. So on the travel note, um, Phoenix Wellness Retreat, which is my core business now, uh, had all of these destination retreats scheduled, and we had to pull every one of them back and cancel them and go online to work with our clients. Um, my other business, Closed Mountain Production, has never been busy because people in the U.S. are taking the time to land, to remodel their home, to add the art to their home because they're spending more time in the house. So we've been extremely busy working with clients, doing new projects, doing new construction projects. Um, but I think that, you know, I also have adopted a lot of all of our buildings are sustainable and sustainable products around in the wellness space so benefit women and girls. So I believe that during this time, so many of us have really focused on what really matters in the world and have taken this opportunity to create a platform to make a difference. So it's 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 actually been really good for my business. It's made me look at things with a lot of clarity. And to make sure that we're doing the right thing to uh, lead in our industry. So you're saying your business has actually gotten busier. <laughs> I have been never been busier, so I'm really pleased. Uh, and my clients keep reaching out. You know, we'll wear a mask, we'll follow up protocol. Please, you know, will you schedule uh, a retreat? Because people are needing it. They need to connect with themselves. I mean, I'm fortunate that I'm in the South where we take long walks, we have a pool that we can go swim laps in the backyard. But if I were up in Washington, D.C., which typically I would be here right now, we don't have quite the same luxuries, um, which is why we stay down here. So, you know, we've been, I, I, my company's been the busiest and uh, profitable yeah. here, please. But I think that our core, the culture has really shifted. And I think, you know, both EO for the work that I get to do to open my eyes um, and just this, this crisis, I think that, that we made the best of it. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing that. I'm glad to hear that this has been uh, – actually had a positive impact, it sounded like, at least for the for the business as a whole. I will want to come back to your story on this uh, in a few questions. Um, I want to switch to Eileen. Uh, Eileen, I know you're based in Malaysia. Um, and again, I'm still thinking like at the beginning of the year, like there was January going into February, right? This is when we were first finding out about COVID, the outbreak in Wuhan, China specifically. Um, I know that within, you know, both in East Asia and Southeast Asia, at least my perspective as an American is that there's been more precautions taken um, or at least a more awareness around potential outbreaks. Um, I'm curious that like, you know, coming from Malaysia and a Southeast Asian perspective, if like when you first heard about what was going on in Wuhan, like if that, if that registered, if that was like, okay, this could be become a problem and if steps were, were taken at all, uh, or if there were, or or if there was, it didn't register. I was wondering what what was that like when you first heard the news about what, the outbreak in in China. Okay, um, that's a that's a very good question because I, that's why I started writing. I said over in here in Asia, we seem to have been very aware of the pandemic as early as in January, and uh, I even recall having to fly to Singapore and masks were already sold out everywhere, and I was very lucky that a friend who was dining with me say, you know, pulled out one and said, Here, here's a donation to you. And that's when I remember it was end of January. So came February, um, we had a big change in our, our, our landscape, in our political landscape. There was a change in the government. Um, the old government was ousted out and then a new government came in. So there was a little bit of uh, instability in our, in our country. Um, yet we went on doing our things and we knew that 
you know, it was coming because we are so near China. We knew that we had to wear our masks already. Um, um, and so there were quite a number of EO members who already prepared for it. They started to to look into opportunities. You know, we had members who started doing sanitizing business. I mean, totally out of what they normally do. And um, I knew that because when we were doing events, we were asking who can do sanitization. And some, suddenly people who were doing baby products says, oh, I'm, I can spray the whole place, you know. And people were going into glove manufacturing um, because we are one of the bigger, biggest, I would say the biggest rubber uh, exporter in the world. Um, we had people going into all sorts of like testing of COVID. So very, very early in February, we had people going there. Um, our lockdown came in March, on March 18, which was a, a, a sudden decision as well. Um, that really caught all of us. And that's that's a whole story altogether. That, um, it's, for me, it's really interesting to, to hear that because, again, you already had the awareness and that's <laughs> interesting that masks were already getting sold out. And I feel <laughs> like coming, at least from the Western perspective, an American perspective, that we were kind of like, definitely lagging <laughs> i kind of i kind of want to switch to alan you know I'm, i know you're dialing in from nashville right i'm i'm in boston myself personally i felt like we were lagging in boston um my my spousal partner is, uh she's originally from taiwan and so she's telling me all this stuff and i'm like what are you talking about and then yeah come march you know the world just seemed to shut down i'm curious what the what the climate was like in nashville and how that impacted your business when you first heard about this outbreak and that it might potentially spread uh, uh, to the rest of the world? Well, it's interesting because, um, you know, for the people outside of the U.S., the U.S. has a, a different view on, on just about everything, I feel, <laughs> than everybody else does. But um, at the beginning of this year, uh, I think we were all bracing for just a, a, pretty, a pretty strong economic year. So from a business standpoint, we, we sell security, um, like physical security devices. So things that stop people from physically kicking in your doors and, and breaking into your house and breaking your windows. So, um, you know, our plan was to do a lot of uh, a lot of branding and, and, and a lot of awareness uh, and to grow. You know, we had strong growth plans for the beginning of the year. And as, uh, as many people in EO will tell you, never let a good crisis go to waste. So, um what what happened here in the U.S. is everyone focused on, oh, my God, the world is ending and they're coming to get me. Um, with uh, with with the uh, initiation of COVID. So, you know, when, when people were, were locked in their homes, it, it actually was this has been a really good year for my business. Um, because as you know, as people stockpiled ammunition and guns here in the United States, uh, they also started to think about uh, uh, security and and keeping their families safe. So it, it ended up working out really well for us. Um, you know, we had also just spent a bunch of money on infrastructure, so most of my most of my team was remote, which you know put us in a pretty good position to uh, to, to work through uh, the crisis um, because we didn't have to worry about social distancing because I was pretty much the only person in my office other than the people in our warehouse. So. Um, you know, at the end of the day, this, this, uh, the, the, the crisis and the pandemic, um, not from a health standpoint, but from a business standpoint, you know, we just happen to be, um, pretty well positioned for it and frankly did what we could to, uh, to, uh, make the most of, of, yeah. you know, the, the, the situation. It sounds like your business actually helped people stay socially distanced. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It kept all those people trying to come by for uh, for for parties out of out of their houses. So, so you could just lock them, lock everybody out, lock don't come out. to my house anymore yeah. for a party. Exactly. Um, I'm I'm glad that it that it helped. This actually has helped your business, or at least had a positive impact on your business, because I know for a lot of different parts, both the United States, but definitely entire countries, um, come that March period, right? Businesses shut down. Economy yeah. shut down. Yeah, and we were, I mean, to, to get to your point, Nashville was, uh, I feel like, behind um, a, a number of other places, it, it, just in terms of the response. Yeah. And Tennessee is still um, a, a red state, and we, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of cases down here, 
And I, I still think we're, we're, we're a little bit behind in terms of um, yeah. our, our distance thing. And we're still having football games and, and, and every, the South cannot live without football. So one, one thing we're going to do is go to football games. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's still contributing to, to uh, relatively high cases through, throughout our region. I'll put some cultural kind of American football, American, uh, football. American right. football. Although, I mean, I think it's the same um, in terms of sports and people get it gathering together. Um, we're going to come back to that. I feel on, in terms of the polit- political climate um, here in the United States. Um, but I want to go to on there um, because you were telling me earlier about the shutdown in Jordan um, and what that was like. Again, this is back in March. It felt like the world was the entire world was just shutting down. Um, what was, what was that like in, in Amman? What was that like in Jordan? Ah, where do I start? Well, I just had come back from a one month trip to the U S uh, we were at with EO actually in San Francisco at the, uh, the Google uh, conference that at strategic Alliance, we sponsor startup, you know, startup grind. And, uh, from there I went back to DC, stayed uh, a couple of weeks and then on to Turkey and Throughout the whole time, you know, people were nervous everywhere in the world. As I, as you were saying, the U.S. was very relaxed. We were going to restaurants, places, zero social distancing. And even when I went, you know, left on Turkish airline on the way in, it was relaxed. On the way back, people started panicking. So I get to Jordan March 6th. And March 16th, you know, um, the morning of March 16th, uh, we had a flight that came out, came from the airport. And uh, people were you know, at the airport told that they have to be going to a quarantine for 14 days um, at hotels paid by the government. So people, you know, were shocked. They, you know, you, you imagine you leave your, uh, you're coming from London five hours later, you land into Jordan and, you know, you're welcomed by the airport security and telling you, you know, we just started full quarantine. So you are escorted to uh, the Dead Sea, a five-star hotel where Marsha and a couple of, you know, you guys that came when we did the Jordan exploration and you were put in a room for 14 days, you know, alone and you cannot uh, leave the room and it's well well guarded. So Jordan officially started a complete quarantine, you know, a a curfew for the first uh, couple of uh, weeks. And, uh, you know, I think the government did a great job trying to contain uh, the virus. Uh, We had very few, you know, cases. And at some point we had 10 days with zero cases. Uh, but, you know, this is a virus you can uh, run, but you cannot hide. Yesterday we hit 1,800 uh, cases in Jordan. So, you know, wow. this is something that we're going to have to be living with, uh, guys. This is the new era. This is the new, you know, uh, uh, conferencing. If it wasn't for COVID, we would be talking about this in New York today, all of us. But, uh, uh, what I'm... What I'm interested in in hearing is you said that the government started a full quarantine, and you said it was. It sounded like it was completely funded. Yeah, yeah. the 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 first The first wave that came, actually, all the people, all the travelers who arrived, were um, escorted to a five star hotel with full meals for 14 days, got paid for by the government because that- they were not told. <laughs> That sounds so incredible. Again, about. coming from a U.S. Yeah, perspective, yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. The government actually, actually, actually program for price. us, we were shocked. But you know, because you were not told that you're going to do this, and then after that, we shut down the airport completely. There was no uh, in or out uh, flights, except for you know, if you're escort, you know, if if people are leaving by their own the country, you know, ev- evacuation or Jordanians, yeah. you know. The government did the way where Jordanians were escorted back, but they had to go in and fill up an application and get priorities. But then they were given options to quarantine at a five-star, four-star, three-star hotel um, right. At, right. At, some, at some given price. But imagine, I mean, as, as you were asking everybody else, you know, you had planned your year. And for me, I, I do a lot of travel. I, about 50% of my time is uh, right, outside right. the country. This is the longest time I've been in Jordan for the past 25 years at one, th- at, at one point. <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm sure your family is very appreciative. Of, uh, of- my wife is ready to uh, ship me out. Trust me. After <laughs> six months, <laughs> I don't think she well, wants me in that. But it's, it's good. It's good. You know, I, I, 
I actually discovered a lot of stuff about uh, the, the kids, the family, the the country, everything else. You know, you can adapt to everything. That I think uh, resilience, um, that kind of adaptation, resilience. I think that's a hallmark of uh, entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, the only constant is change and survive. And um, you know, I'm noticing this this consistent theme of travel. I think all of us had already had a lot of travel planned for 2020. Obviously, things got shut down. Um, I re- I think like certain countries were really impacted by that because their economies depend so much on travel and tourism in particular. And Christina, I wanted to ask you about this because you know you're sharing with me like you know Costa Rica, right? I visited Costa Rica myself. I know that a big draw is around ecotourism. You know, I've gone on the uh, you know to, to tr- to trek through the jungles and go through the beaches and it's a beautiful country as, as a foreigner to visit. Um, but then everything shut down, right? People couldn't travel. And um, I'm curious how that not just impacted your business. You shared a little bit about that, but like the community, like how did that impact like your community? Yes. Um, actually for us, it has been unprecedented, right? Um when when everything closed down, the same as in Jordan, I think it was in March. My birthday is on March 14th, so I will never forget. It was the last day. Seriously, wow. it was the last day before everything shut down. Uh, and it was around March 16th that the airport was closed. Um, and it was, for us in Costa Rica, high season is from December until April. So we were, the whole country was in the middle of high season. So we had so many people here traveling and the role of like the industry itself, the level of service and quality that has been um, shown, you know, by the industry is amazing because for, for two months uh, we were working so hard on just making sure that everyone was able to be back home safely right? And take care of all the travelers that were here. We had, I mean, it's not only the people in land, we are also operators for the cruise lines, right? So we had so many cruises here um, that we needed to take care of the people, make sure that everything, everyone was safe and healthy. The country was, you know, in the global shock that what is going on here? How do we handle it? The country itself uh, was very efficient on the way they were they handled the pandemic at the beginning, just making sure that we had very small cases so that we can learn, I guess, the, the learning curve of the rest of the world and just start implementing things here. But from the industry itself, it was like a, like a shock, you know, to have zero mm-hmm. tourism, everything closed, no one could come in and just making sure that we could take everyone out and safe. So that left a huge impact. In it, must, it must have impacted uh, like employment. Exactly. Uh, like employment we had imp- some, in the, some communities, for example, in the Northern Caribbean part or here where I'm at right now, um, 100% unemployment. Right. They depended, depending, they were dependent 100% in the tourism industry. Um with no other resources, not no, no other skills, and that was for me a, one of the one of the most worrisome um, situations that we needed to attend. Right. So of course, there's so many people like yourself that have been here um, that love Costa Rica in a way. You know, the pura vida lifestyle that they have have enjoyed sustainability, ecotourism, and everyone was like, "How can I help?" I want, you know, I'm in the U.S. I go every so often. I'm in Canada. How can I help European clients saying like, I know this is very hard. Please keep the national parks um, intact. How can we help um, the country, the industry? So that was um, fantastic, like a fantastic response. And from my side, I I created a project to help all these communities um, that were with 100% unemployment. Uh, and basically, we contacted a bunch of celebrities from Hollywood, um, all of the celebrities that are uh, from here, Costa Rica, soccer players and everything. And we just created like a game so that people will actually try to buy a ticket to win a chance to have a half hour um, talk with celebrities. And everything that we got from there, uh, we just gave um, food to all these communities that are in the rural areas because what happened first is that the first response was of course to the cities right to the main cities but all of these tourist areas were not 
a key priority for the government, right? So that is what I did. It's like, okay, since I had all those insights of all the communities that did not have access to, um, to any aid, I took those communities, talked to the celebrities, and we did a huge wow. project with over 150 celebrities saying, yes, I want to help for free. And a lot of people just chipping in. And we Christina, just helped how, around 2,000 families. How many, how many people would you say, just rough estimate, ballpark figure, how many people would you say have been impacted by your efforts to just kind of support? Right now, we have, we have as of today, we have helped almost 2,000 families, uh, which is around almost, uh, I would say, maybe more than 10,000 or 12,000 people, roughly. Wow. And we have helped seven communities right now um, wow. along the country. Yeah, and that is pretty cool. But I will tell you a story. It's very quick. Uh, here in where I'm staying, it's a blue zone, and turtles arrive. There's turtle nesting. And they reopened for the first time since March in last week. So I went with my friends uh, to see the turtles. And one of those communities one, was one that we were helping for two months, right? And when I was there uh, with the turtle nesting, I just paid the entrance and you get a guide, right? So we were walking, seeing the turtles, which is an amazing experience to see. And the guide, I was talking to him and he said, are you the woman from Juntos Costa Rica? And I'm like, yeah, how do you know? And he's like, your voice sounds very familiar from the WhatsApp. And I'm like, really? <laughs> and he said, like, thank you. You helped our family for two months, right? And, and he said, like, well, I felt very grateful, but I also a little bit worried because I'm like, maybe I'm too intense on my WhatsApp voicemails because he recognized my voice out of the, you know, out of the blue. That, that's, that's, in, cool. that's incredible. That's incredible, though. That sounds like... Like, I mean, wow, you really helped this man and his family. Exactly. During a very challenging, very challenging time. Exactly. uh, So that for me was like very, very inspirational. And I felt very grateful that I was able to actually by myself, me just watching a result two months afterwards and being able to sustain a family uh, until they are able to reopen, which actually happened a week ago. Uh, so, thank you. Thank, cool. for sh- <laughs> thank you for sharing that, that story with us. And I think that's, um, there's actually a wonderful theme of, you know, I think as entrepreneurs and as business owners, like, you know, yeah, we're focused on our businesses, but we have an impact, whether it's positive or negative, we undoubtedly have an impact on the communities that we serve and that we're in. And I wanted to ask Eileen, um, you were sharing with me about Malaysia with your entrepreneurs organization chapter there. What, you were doing to kind of help the communities around you. Could you share a little bit about, you know, what, yeah, what was some of the challenge that the community was facing because of COVID and how did uh, you and your EO chapter help them? Um, I think the community was our own members itself. We were, we were devastated. We didn't expect that to happen. And um, when that happened, all eyes were on us on the board because they, everyone just didn't, totally they had no idea what to do. So um, I think agility is the word, being able to move very quickly. And what our board did was we shifted lanes very fast uh, as soon as there was a shutdown and we reacted very swiftly. Um, we managed to do about 52 events for the year compared to our normal 16 events. And wow. this is this is phenomenal feat in EO history, I would say. And and this was only possible because we could reach out to the untouchables. You know, the people who who are respectable business magnets who would never give us a time of the day and now they are happy to share with us. Um, so we reached out to these people, um, even to our 93-year-old uh, Prime Minister, Tun Mahathir, which was ousted uh, a month ago. And interestingly, it was his first time on Zoom and he was super excited, you know. Um, And um, we used this time very well because we wanted to train our staff, our people. So we impacted not only EO members, but their families as well, you know. And we took that time to learn because learning is such a a big thing for us. And uh, we have this, for instance, an honor to have this gentleman who saved our Malaysian Airlines which was ailing to, uh, he spoke with us because he was, uh, he was, he specialized in managing crisis. And uh, what we learned was when we face a crisis, you know, this is the first thing he taught us. This is like three days into our, our lockdown, you know, 
It says the first thing that we need to do as a CEO on day one is to declare a crisis. He says that we need to form a nerve center to tell the people what to do by sending them circulars to all the staff announcing the crisis and the way forward. So communication was key. And secondly, he said, we need to um, know how much cash does the company have at the moment and how long does this cash, how, can, how long can it last and how we can preserve it. Um, so he taught us that we had to be very honest and open with our cash, cash situation, which we normally don't really announce it to the staff. But um, to do this, you know, they, they had our, they, they, they sort of like looked at us, you know, with more, um, they, they, they had more confidence with us, I would say. And then we were taught how to create a crisis team. You know, like for instance, the cash team, how to preserve your cash, the revenue team, how to generate revenue, the cost team, how to cut costs, the customer team, you know, how to manage customers during crisis, um, the people team, the communication team, how to best communicate and how to put the messages across authentically. And he said to be very authentic when you speak to these people, to our clients, to our staff, to, to anybody. So that gave us a lot of um, confidence as a, as a group um, because we knew that we had to translate all these strategies into operational plans. So that kept us very busy. Um, and I, we had a lot of feedback from members saying that, you know, people were saying, how come we didn't look, look like, you know, they were, we were not very anxious. We were not worried so much. And that's because we had EO behind us um, yeah. as a community. I'm know. glad. I'm glad. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it sounds like the chapter coming together, being able to support one another was really key. And I wanted to direct um, this one question to uh, Marsha. <clears throat> this within EO, I know we call this like 5% share. Um, is Marsha, you'd shared with us within EO that you had actually, you and your, um, your partner had actually tested positive for COVID. Um, and so you experienced this firsthand. And I'm, I wanted you to share, I know we only have like a few minutes left, but you know, what that experience was like, and if, you know, there were people that really helped you through that, that period and that time. So, um, Brian, definitely we had so many people who helped us through it. Uh, I would say at the top of the list were all my friends from EO, from the entrepreneurs organization. We had a prayer group praying. My husband actually um, was in the ICU for a week. I had a mild case. I was knocked out for about three days. And I had that mindset that, you know, well, I'm not really sick because I've rarely been sick. Um, and I did recover quickly. We both, my husband did um, leave the hospital and recover. And we learned a lot from the experience. I mean, I think... Um, First, to be grateful for life and good health, but also who you can really count on. The people who were there, the, you know, experts from New York who called the doctors at the hospital that my husband was um, staying in, make sure that they were up to date with the best uh, different treatments. And they actually started doing the treatment that they gave my husband to everybody in Florida afterwards. So... He feels very fortunate, we both do. Um, but it's a wake up call for all of us that as, as a global community, we have to work together. There's so many things that we need to um, address, whether it's our climate change or health issues, we need to come together um, as communities, as political leaders, as entrepreneurs to truly change the world for the better and support each other and listen to each other. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Marcia. And I think that's a great note to end this, uh, to end our panel on. And so I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing your experiences and your stories from leading and managing, navigating your businesses and your companies throughout the last uh, nine months, beginning of 2020. I know I think a lot of us came into this year with a lot different expectations for what was going to happen. For a lot of us, it was very challenging. It sounds like for a lot of us, there's also a huge opportunity that this year has uh, actually helped your, had a positive impact on your businesses. And I think probably the greatest theme from listening to all of you is the importance of, you know, of resilience and of like entrepreneurs to be able to bring their communities and their countries together. I think that's really, really powerful. 
and that entrepreneurs, I think, can have a disproportionately positive impact on their communities and on their countries. And that's what I think I heard in all of our, your experiences on this panel. So thank you all for, for being on this panel. Thank you, everybody who uh, has dialed in to listen in. If you'll find out more about the Entrepreneurs Organization, check us out at eonetwork.org. And if there's one last thing and ask us all to do, can we take a group selfie? One more, one more groupie. So I'm going to hit the groupie button. The groupie. And I don't know if this will, all the attendees will be able to get in on the groupie. So Demetra, Michael, Jana, uh, and Frank. Let's see what happens. Start. Go selfie. Take a photo. All right. I see five people have finished the selfie. Six. There's like 10 of us here. Six, seven. Am I dead? <laughs> Eight. I I got eight. We got anybody else still need to take a selfie? Actually, I don't think I can touch the button. I think Marsha, you started the button. Oh, I did. So I think you does. It, do you have a button in front of you, Marsha, that says "end selfie"? Okay. Did it work? Rendering. All right, here we go. It did it. Okay, you did it. Nice. See everybody out there. Thank you, everybody, for joining today's panel. Thank you, everybody, for dialing into today's panel. Enjoy the rest of the conference and go out there uh, and make a difference. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye. Have a great day. Bye, Marcia. Bye. Bye, everybody. Did you save it, Brian? <laughs> I did save this okay. one, I, I think. Don't... Let me post it in the WhatsApp. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both for, for dialing. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you. All right.